China's secretive space plane launches while the US one delays, SpaceX performs a Christmas-themed rollout of the next Starship to fly, and Relativity fires up its most powerful engine yet. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 15th of December, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. Let's start off with some good rocket engine fire with Relativity Space's test of its Eon R engine. This test was the first on a full scale Eon R Methalox engine, and it occurred at the company's R complex at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. 13 of these Eon R engines will power the first stage of Relativity's upcoming Terran R rocket for a combined 1,520 tons of thrust at liftoff. According to the company, in this first full-scale test, the Eon R engine ran for 10 seconds and at 70% of its final thrust to make an initial validation of the engine components. These components had been tested separately for many months prior, but now it was the moment to test it all integrated on an engine. There was actually a lot of footage of that subcomponent testing shared by Relativity in the months leading up to this test, and we got no complaints with that. Keep sharing that cool footage, Relativity, you're doing great. With this test now completed, the next steps will involve longer duration tests at higher power and, as Relativity says, more blue fire. Can't really get enough of that, can we? As CEO of the company Tim Ellis said, this is really a huge milestone, as this engine is essentially an order of magnitude more powerful than the Eon 1 engine that Relativity had developed for the Terran 1 rocket. Of course, we'll be here waiting for more Eon R tests to occur, for more of that blue fire to come, and we'll be covering all of that progress as it happens. This week we also got an interesting view of Amazon's Kuiper satellites. You may remember from a few months ago that Amazon launched a pair of prototype Kuiper satellites on a ULA Atlas V rocket. Back then, we noted how weird it was that we really had no views at all of these satellites, either on the ground during processing or even during launch and deployment. All we've gotten so far was just the transport crates and a view of the payload deployer attached to the Centaur used on that mission. But pictures of the satellites themselves? None. Of course, there are other ways for people to get a view of them. HEOSpace was able to take a view of one of these two prototype satellites from another satellite also orbiting the Earth. Yes, that's a picture of a satellite from another satellite. Something that's becoming a lot more common these days, by the way. This first in-space view of the Kuiper satellite gives away the shape of the spacecraft, which appears to be roughly box-shaped with two deployable solar panels coming out from the top. It's not the first image of one of these, though. Amateur observers from the ground have been able to do that in the past, but this is the first time that they've been imaged from space rather than from the ground. And all of this comes right as Amazon confirms that it has performed testing of the Spacecraft Inter-Satellite Laser Link Communication System. This system will enable the spacecraft in the constellation to hop signals from one to another without needing ground stations, which allows coverage over places where the nearest ground station is several thousands of kilometers away. This is a very similar system to the one used on Starlink satellites right now, with the difference being that the initial Starlink satellites were not equipped with these laser links. Instead, they got introduced a bit later into the deployment process. With Kuiper, Amazon says that it'll be implemented from the beginning. The tests were able to successfully confirm pointing and acquisition of the link in both ways at a data transfer rate of 100 gigabits per second. Now, of course, the question is when these will start launching. ULA recently shared a picture of the Atlas V factory floor with several Atlas V and Centaur III stages awaiting for these satellites to be ready for launch. So it looks like all that's left is for them to start being produced at scale and shipped to the launch site. Pivoting from potential launches, now let's take a look at this week in launches. Starting off the week, we had a Falcon 9 launching on December 8th at 8.03 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East in Vandenberg. The rocket was carrying another batch of Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The booster for this flight, B1071, was flying for a 13th time and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. This was the shortest turnaround time for SpaceX's West Coast launch pad, launching six and a half days after the first flight of South Korea's 425 project and beating the previous record turnaround time of eight days. SpaceX has now launched a total of 5,581 Starlink satellites, of which 376 have re-entered and 4,536 are now in operational orbit. 
Landspace's Zuke 2 rocket launched this week for its third time overall, now making it not only the first Methalox rocket to fly into orbit, but also the first to do so twice. Liftoff took place on December 8th at 2339 UTC from Site 96 at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket was carrying three satellites into a sun-synchronous orbit. The first of these three satellites was the Tianyi-33 spacecraft from the Hunan University of Science and Technology to test a variety of technologies for upcoming satellites such as new thermal control systems, new power systems, new software, etc. The other two satellites were the Honghu-1 and Honghu-2, built by Space City Aerospace Company, that also carry a number of technology demonstrations for future satellite mega-constellations, including Xenon, Krypton, and Argon-based ion thrusters, similar to those on Starlink satellites. The flight was also interesting, as it featured logos on the first stage from toy maker Popmart. After that, we had the launch of a Changzheng 2D rocket on December 10th at 158 UTC from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center in China. It was carrying another trio of Yaogan 39 satellites into low Earth orbit. These, like all Yaogan satellites, are reconnaissant spacecraft launched for the Chinese military. It's theorized that two of them in the trio of Yaogan 39 spacecraft have imaging capability, and the third has synthetic aperture radar imaging capabilities, but for now, this is all classified, so it's just a theory. And this week, we had an even more classified launch out of China, with the launch of the country's secretive military space plane into low Earth orbit. Now, we normally would show the footage of the launch with Ryan's great launch graphic showing his trajectory and orbit and such, but there's actually no footage of this launch. Even the launch time is approximate, based on a lot of other secondhand observations. Now, the launch is believed to have happened on December 14th at 1410 UTC from the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center using a modified Changzheng 2F rocket. Now, we know from a launch of this space plane last year that this modified CZ-2F carries a fairing with protrusions that allow the space plane's wings and stabilizers to fit when the spacecraft is encapsulated inside of it. According to U.S. Space Force, who's tracking the space plane, it's currently on an approximate 340-kilometer orbit around the Earth at a 50-degree orbital inclination. Electron returned to flight earlier today with its The Moon God Awakens mission taking place out of New Zealand. The rocket was carrying the QPS SAR-5 satellite into a low Earth orbit. This satellite is a 100-kilogram satellite built by the Institute for Kyushu Pioneers of Space, or IQPS, that will be taking synthetic aperture radar images in all weather conditions. This was Electron's first flight after a failure back in September that grounded the rocket in order to investigate and fix the issue that caused the failure. We had Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck on NSF Live about a month ago talking about the issue in detail, so check that out if you want to know a lot more about it. Now you may have noticed that of these launches that we just covered, there were far fewer SpaceX launches than usual, and that a big one was also missing from the list. That is because, sadly, they've been delayed. Yes, I'm talking about, of course, the launch of Falcon Heavy with the X-37B space plane that sadly was scrubbed right before propellant load just earlier this week. According to SpaceX, it was an issue with the ground systems that prompted the scrub, and then weather and rocket issues appear to have delayed this launch even further. The Falcon Heavy was brought horizontal and then back into the hangar, which usually means hardware needs to be changed on the rocket. That is also usually followed by a delay of at least a week, but it could be even longer than that. Weather has definitely not been nice to Falcon 9 and its Starlink Group 634 mission, which also had to be delayed at T-1 minute and 45 seconds due to high ground winds. The weather in Florida is forecast to be so bad that this launch may not even happen until the weekend now. Another spaceflight event that has been delayed due to weather is the return of SpaceX's CRS-29 Cargo Dragon from the ISS. NASA and SpaceX had to cancel its return earlier this week due to the poor weather forecast on the splashdown site off the coast of Florida. This return also slipped into the weekend and could very well delay further if weather continues to be bad. All of this means that SpaceX's goal of having 100 launches by the end of the year may not be met by just a couple of launches. It's a bit disappointing that it was mostly weather and unforeseen rocket issues that have forced the delays, but it'll certainly be a learning opportunity for the SpaceX teams to improve even more for next year's goal of launching 144 times. ULA's Vulcan rocket has completed all pre-launch testing and is now ready to finally receive its payload for its debut launch. 
You may remember the rocket already completed a wet dress rehearsal and engine test on the launch pad earlier this year. However, an issue with the Centaur 5 test article on test stand prompted a small redesign of the stage's forward dome, and therefore a change of Centaur upper stage for the first flight of Vulcan. With the new Centaur 5 arriving at the Cape just last month, it was just a matter of days until the rocket rolled out to repeat that wet dress rehearsal ahead of launch. And it did so last week with the roll taking place on December 6th. The first attempt at this second wet dress rehearsal took place on December 8th, but according to ULA CEO Tori Bruno, this test didn't fully go according to plan. He said, quote, Vehicle performed well, ground system had a couple of routine issues being corrected. In the same tweet, he also mentioned the desire to perform a full rehearsal ahead of launch, and that means the debut of Flight of Vulcan is now going to be no earlier than January 8th instead of Christmas Eve. Yes, you can add that to all of the delays that we've had this week. Vulcan was then rolled back to the hangar to solve the issue and rolled out again to repeat the wet dress rehearsal on December 12th. Finally, this time it worked, and Tori said, quote, The critical events we wanted to demonstrate happened nominally and on the timeline. So that now clears the path for Vulcan to get its payload on top over the next few weeks and roll back out for launch in just a few more weeks. Let's just hope that at least by then, the Florida weather will be much more favorable. And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. This week, Axiom Space showed off progress on the first habitat module of its space station. The HAB-1 module, the first module of Axiom's upcoming space station, is coming along at a good pace at the construction facilities from Thales Alenia Space, the company building these modules for Axiom. Thales and Axiom have been very busy for the past few years developing and starting construction of that first module, with bulkheads and barrel sections taking shape over the last year or so. More and more of these components are starting to be produced and should soon be welded together to form the main structure of this module. This week, Axiom also announced its launch has been delayed from 2025 to 2026, so it looks like we'll have to wait a bit until we see it docked to the ISS. Orion Space is preparing its Gravity One rocket for its first flight later this month. The Gravity One is an all-solid-fueled three-stage rocket with strap-on boosters that, once launched, should be the most powerful commercial rocket in China, producing 600 tons of thrust at liftoff and being capable of launching more than 6 tons into low Earth orbit. This rocket is kind of reminiscent to one that you might build in Kerbal Space Program, as you can see on these images, and it should be launching later this month from a marine platform off the coast of China. More recently, the company completed rehearsals to transfer the rocket from the ground onto its marine platform with what appears to be an inflatable mock-up. Certainly a lot of weird-looking rockets coming our way in the near future. This week, iSpace conducted the second hop of its Hyperbola 2 test vehicle at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center. The flight took place on December 10th at 9.07 UTC. It reached a height of 343 meters and lasted for 63 seconds. This is another step in the company's ambitions to build the much larger Hyperbola 3 rocket, a partially reusable Methalox rocket that will see its first stage propulsively land back on Earth for reuse. And this is not the only hop test that we may see this month at Jiquan, as Landspace confirmed after the latest launch of its ZUK-2 rocket that it plans to perform hop tests of a scale version of the first stage of the ZUK-3 rocket before the end of the year. The company already has the stand to place the rocket and fly it, so it's just a matter of getting it out there. If you watched last week's episode of This Week in Spaceflight, you might remember our story about Stoke Space sharing a picture of a development tank of the first stage for the company's Nova rocket. Well, now the tank has been shipped to Stokes' testing facility at Moses Lake and should soon be providing all of the juicy data that the company will need to develop the full first stage tankage. According to Stokes CEO Andy Lapsa, this test article had the same diameter and domes as the final thing, but it is not the full length. As you can see in this picture, the Nova rocket definitely promises to be a rather big one. But it wasn't just Stoke that rolled a stainless steel vehicle this week. SpaceX also rolled Ship 28 down to the launch site at Starbase. The vehicle had been at the production site inside of the high bay for the last few weeks, primarily having work done on its heat shield tiles and readying it for testing. With that work now completed, the ship was rolled to the launch site in a very Christmas-themed manner with snowmen, a reindeer on the SPMT, a Christmas tree, and even a Santa. These guys really had fun setting all of this up. 
Ship 28 is set to be the next Starship vehicle to fly alongside Super Heavy Booster 10, and it will now start its engine test campaign. That campaign could start as early as Saturday, December 16th, as a test enclosure has been posted by Cameron County for that day, between 6 a.m. and 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Of course, we'll be live to cover whatever testing occurs with Ship 28, and watch out for Monday's Starbase Update episode for a full rundown on what's been going on at Starbase this week. And now let's take a look at what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Starting off this upcoming week, we'll have a rare launch of a Chongzheng 5 rocket with a yet unknown payload. China's most capable rocket rolled out earlier this week with a visibly longer payload fairing, which could mean some interesting stuff is being launched on it. But as of recording, it's not yet known. Liftoff is scheduled to occur within a 54 minute long window that opens on December 15th at 1332 UTC. A Hyperbola-1 rocket from iSpace is set to launch this week with a yet unknown payload from Jiquan. Liftoff is planned to occur within a 1 hour 34 minute window that opens on December 16th at 6.53 UTC. A Soyuz 2.1B rocket is set to launch the Arctica M No. 2 satellite from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Liftoff is set to take place on December 16th at 9.17 UTC. The departure of the SpaceX CRS-29 Dragon from the International Space Station has now been rescheduled for December 17th at 10.05 UTC, if Florida weather allows it. Also pending good weather in Florida is the launch of Falcon 9 with the Starlink Group 634 now set to occur within a 4.5 hour window that opens on December 18th at 4 o'clock UTC. Blue Origin's new Shepard rocket is set to return to flight next week on December 18th with the launch of the company's NS-24 mission. The mission will be the first one since September of 2022 when the rocket suffered a failure during flight. While a launch window hasn't been published yet, we do know that the rocket will not have any passengers on board and will be a cargo flight, just like the one that failed last year. Hopefully this time around it goes a lot better. And to wrap up the week, we'll also have the departure of the Cygnus NG-19 spacecraft from the ISS. Release of the SS Laurel Clark Cygnus spacecraft from the ISS robotic arm is currently scheduled to occur on December 21st at 1530 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.